Hey guys, Brandon here with IFAST University. Uh, today we're going to go over the cardiovascular system and really just a brief introduction to it. Uh, there's a lot more to it than we're going to get to in this video. Um, in the coming months, we're going to be going through a lot of exercise physiology just in case anybody on here hasn't formally had x -phys or you need to brush up on it because you haven't seen it in a while. Um, so that after that, once we get through all of it, we can go ahead and start applying it into the gym and training and assessment. Uh, we just got to make sure everybody's caught up first before we do that. So the cardiovascular system, let's get into it. Why is it important? Right, it, its main job, for our sake, is to transport oxygen to the tissues. Right, I got to get fresh oxygen to the muscle so that I can continue making ATP aerobically. Right, if you've had any energy systems, you hopefully remember that the aerobic system is able to give us a lot of ATP, but it's got to have oxygen to do that. And it's the cardiovascular system job, cardiovascular system's job to get that oxygen there, right? To get it to the muscles so that we can keep pumping out ATP. Um, by far, one of my favorite exercise physiology quotes I've ever heard uh, is from Dr. McKeskey, who I've had the pleasure of working with and learning from. It says, the cardiovascular system is a slave to the metabolic demands of the body. Right, so anytime I want to do something, anytime I need energy or metabolism increases, the cardiovascular system has to ramp up, right, it's a slave here, has to ramp up so that I can get fresh oxygen in and CO2 out, um, so I can keep up with metabolism and keep things going. Alright, so there's five main parts of the system that we're going to worry about. Um, we can even break this down a little further into three parts, and we'll do that just in case you're really, really new to this and we got to simplify it a little bit, make it more digestible. <clears throat> so our five parts. First, we got to pump, right? we got to have something to contract and pump out the blood, get it to where we need it to go so we can have gas exchange. All right, right? Just in the middle of the chest, off to the left a little bit. Our second part, we got to have a distribution circuit. So we're talking about the arteries, right? So the systemic arteries are going to start with the aorta, uh, which we'll get to here in a second. But these are really, really high pressure because um, we're really close to the pump in these blood vessels. Got to have exchange vessels. I got to have capillaries, um, which are really thin walled, and we'll get to, that uh, give me the ability to exchange gases where needed in the appropriate direction so that we can keep metabolism going. Also, I have low pressure circuit. I got to get blood back to the heart via the veins. In our last part, I gotta have fluid to get uh, so that the pump here has something to pump out. We gotta have fluid in the pipes, right? So we really have three main parts. We got a pump, i.e., our heart. We got pipes, arteries, capillaries, veins, and we got fluid in those pipes, the blood. All right. So if we look at a microscopy section, or we look under a microscope here at a skeletal muscle. You'll notice that they're really well-defined um, individual muscle cells here, right? They even have little striations we're able to see pretty clearly. You can see these dark spots are all the nuclei. Uh, there's multiple nuclei here in each muscle cell, okay? Uh, to contrast that to cardiac muscle, it doesn't look as clean here when we look under, at a, under a microscope at it, right? It kind of runs the same way, but there's something called intercalated discs that connect um, the cardiac muscle fibers together to one another, right? And the reason that's important is if they weren't connected and the heart went to go contract, it wouldn't be very synchronized, right? So we'd have a heart that's either like quivering or just kind of shaking, and it wouldn't be very efficient at actually pumping blood. So we got to have muscle cells that are connected and can kind of depolarize and contract in a wave-like fashion almost so that um, we have something that's synchronized to pump out blood, and it's much more efficient this way. All right, sticking on the heart, uh, we're going to go through quick and dirty um, blood flow through the heart, in and out of the heart, and then we'll get to the arteries, veins, and capillaries in the coming slides. All right, so let's start right here in the left atrium. If we go from the left atrium, we're going to follow that into the left ventricle. The left ventricle um, is separated from the left atrium here by a set of valves. I'm not worried that you know the name of them right now. But this valve here prevents backflow. So when this left ventricle contracts, blood doesn't flow back into the left atrium. It gets pumped out of this aorta. The aorta 
takes it to the systemic circulation. In our case, we're worried about getting blood to the uh, muscles in the upper body or to the lower body. We've got some other pipes that we'll get to, and then from those other pipes, we come back to the vena cava, either the superior vena cava or the inferior vena cava, which will take us to the right atrium. From the right atrium, just like the left atrium, we're going to go to a ventricle, our right ventricle, separated by valves. Right ventricle through another set of valves, um, out the pulmonary arteries, which are going to take us to either the right or the left lung. And from there, some pipes that we'll get to, and then the pulmonary veins on either side, taking us back to the left atrium. Right. So again, real quick, left atrium, left ventricle, out of the aorta, to the muscles, from the muscles, back to the vena cava, vena cava to the right atrium, right ventricle, out of the pulmonary arteries to the lungs, from the lungs, back via the pulmonary veins to our left atrium, all right? All right, so let's get into these pipes now. All right, the first one we mentioned was our high pressure distribution circuit. So we gotta have arteries, um, and since they are high pressure, these arteries have to be fairly thick to withstand this pressure, right? If they were too thin, um, the walls of them would essentially just blow out or balloon out um, and we wouldn't be able to keep pressure and we'd have a lot of blood flow issues there. <clears throat> Excuse me. So they're very thick walled to deal with this high pressure. Um, and there's really three, three parts of the arteries here. We have the aorta right out of the heart, right out of the left ventricle that we talked about. We have arteries and then we have arterioles. Right? And Dr. McKeskey, who I mentioned, um, always says the arterioles are kind of like the traffic cops of the cardiovascular system. Right? What he means is these arterioles have a pretty good sized layer of smooth muscle and that smooth muscle can contract and if it contracts um, we're trying to get blood flow away from that area or they can dilate, excuse me, and if they dilate we're going to allow increased blood flow to that area. All right, so let's say that you get up and you decide to start working out, you're warming up, the arterioles that are going to those muscles that are becoming active are going to dilate so that I can get more fresh blood and oxygen there. And the arterioles, say going to the gut and the intestines and the stomach, are going to start to constrict so that I start keeping blood flow away from those areas because it's not important right now that I digest food. It's important for me to get these muscles, um, get these muscles going and get metabolism ramped up. All right, our second vessels are our capillaries. Right. If you guys notice here, they're not as thick as the arteries and arterioles. Um, they're actually only one cell layer thick, which allows for gas exchange, which was the big deal here. <clears throat> so really thin-walled vessels. Um, and Just like the arterioles, we have a, a ring of smooth muscle at the beginning of each capillary called the pre-capillary sphincter. Right. And just like the arterioles are the traffic cops and they're um, controlling blood flow to different areas, once we get into the muscle and start getting towards the capillaries, uh, the capillary sphincter here, the precapillary sphincter, is going to control uh, local blood flow a little bit more than the arterioles did, right? Just because we're getting more and more specific into smaller vessels. <clears throat> and one thing to note um, that I think is misinterpreted all the time or misinformed is if we look at these capillaries, they're really, really small around. But if we put all the capillaries in the body together, it's this huge surface area that you're going to see, right? Um, we'll have some graphs of this in a second. I just want to make a note of that because a lot of times I've read or heard, talked to people and they'll think that blood flow is so, th so slow through the capillaries because the red blood cells kind of have to line up one by one. Um, that's not really the case. Blood flow is slow through here because there's such a big surface area that it doesn't have to flow fast. And that's advantageous because if I can slow down the flow here, I have a longer time for gas exchange to occur, which means I get more oxygen to the muscle for metabolism, and I get more CO2 out of the muscle so that I can get it to the lungs and breathe it out. All right, our fourth part, veins, getting the blood back to the heart. Um, veins are somewhere in the middle on thickness, uh, not as thick as our, our arteries, but not as thin as the capillaries, right? There's no gas exchange here. <clears throat> One thing to note is there is a really low pressure in these veins, which means blood flow is pretty slow as we're going through here. 
Um, luckily, we have these valves that help with uh, keeping blood flow one direction. Okay, so if we're looking at these valves um, on this next slide, if you look at a vein running through a muscle or between muscles, and a muscle contracts, we get something called a, a muscle pump or a milking of these veins. All right, so when these muscles contract, they start to squeeze on this vein, and since these valves are one way, I get blood that flows back in the direction that I would want it, and this valve down here prevents it from flowing backwards. Right? Um, again, Dr. McKeskey tells us, I find it a pretty funny story of, he's from Texas, he says you go to a Catholic wedding and they're forever long, it's hot in Texas, the middle of the summer when we're having a wedding, and there's always one person standing up at the altar that passes out. Right, one of the groomsmen, it never fails, passes out. Right, so these guys are standing there for a long, long period of time. They're not wiggling their toes, they're not moving their feet around, they're not moving their legs. So, they're not getting this muscle pump or this muscle milking of the veins here, which means they have blood that's pulling in their legs which means blood's not getting back to the heart, which means I'm not getting fresh oxygenated blood to the brain or to the tissues, and they pass out, right? Also, if you guys have ever seen varicose veins or heard of that, um, where we get a deficiency in these valves, and this muscle pump doesn't work anymore because blood flow is going to flow both ways, you can kind of see, if you've seen varicose veins, they look kind of distended, they're a little more purple or blue than a normal vein, um, just because these valves aren't doing their job anymore. All right, a few graphs here. Uh, graphs are boring, but I think these are really, really helpful to illustrate some, some big points. Right, so we're looking, looking at diameter of the vessels. Right, arteries and veins are really big, like we talked about, huge diameter. Uh, if we take an individual one, and then the closer we get to the gas exchange point or the capillaries, the smaller and smaller the diameter gets. Total cross-sectional area we kind of mentioned as well. Uh, even though the capillaries are really small around, or right, a small diameter, if we take the total sum of all the capillaries in the body, we have a huge surface area. And this is going to become important when we look at the fourth graph here. Uh, average blood pressure. So we start at the heart and the, the arteries and the aorta here. <clears throat> really high pressure. The farther we get away from that pump, pressure bleeds off just because we have more and more area. And the farther we get away again, the lower that pressure becomes. All right, so this fourth one and our second graph that we looked at up here kind of tie things together, I think, bring up a, a really important point. Right, we said these capillaries, if we take the total sum of them, we have a huge cross-sectional area. Okay, because we have a, such a large cross-sectional area there, if you look at our last graph, that means velocity is slowed down. Remember, that's advantageous because if I can keep the blood there for... Um, an extra half a second or however long it is, a few milliseconds, we have more time for gas exchange to occur. Right? So the bigger the cross-sectional area, the slower the velocity of the blood flow. Right? All right, our fifth and final part of this system is the blood, the fluid that we're pumping through these pipes. Right, so we have three parts of blood. We have plasma or water. <clears throat> We have white blood cells uh, that are really concerned with infection and healing. And we have our formed elements or our red blood cells. Right? And these are the ones that we're really worried about, um, the red blood cells and the plasma. Plasma will come more into play when we get into adaptations to exercise in a later video. <clears throat> so if we look at a red blood cell, um, each red blood cell has a iron-containing protein called hemoglobin. Right? And we really have two ways in the blood to transport gases. Um, oxygen, what we're talking about. So we'll stay on oxygen. So I've got two ways to transport oxygen. These hemoglobin groups on these red blood cells can grab oxygen. That's the main way that we're going to transport oxygen in the blood. Or I'll have very small amounts of oxygen actually in the plasma or in the fluid of the blood without being bound to hemoglobin. Um, the reason we don't see a lot of oxygen in the plasma itself, as oxygen doesn't dissolve or diffuse into liquid very well, i.e., we don't have any, or we don't have very much um, oxygen in the fluid then, because it takes a lot of pressure to push that oxygen in there. Right. So again, most of our um, oxygen carrying 
capabilities and capacity are going to come from the hemoglobin, these iron groups, on each red blood cell. It will carry oxygen to the tissue and drop it off for us. All right, so now let's take a zoom out a little bit and take a look at this whole cardiovascular circuit, right? We have this closed circuit that allows for us to get blood flow and gas exchange where we need it, um, hopefully pretty efficiently. All right, so let's start with the left ventricle, which we mentioned. From the left ventricle, we're going to come out of the aorta, from the aorta to the arteries. From the arteries, we have, oh, sorry, let's back up here. So left ventricle, aorta. From the aorta, we have two places that we can go. Right, we can go into systemic circulation. So we'll go to our arteries here. Or we can also go into coronary circulation, right? So you got to remember that the heart itself, um, all this myocardium, needs oxygen as well. Right, so we have two places that we can send the blood out of the aorta into coronary circulation directly to the heart muscle. Or we can send it into peripheral circulation, so the arteries, arterioles, again, are traffic cops that are kind of regulating blood flow. Um, they can dilate or they can constrict, depending on where blood is needed at the time. From the arterioles to the capillaries, right, so now we're at the tissue, in our case muscle, where there, we have thin, thin walls of these capillaries, which allows for oxygen to go into the muscle to be used for aerobic metabolism. Um, and we also get CO2 that is transported out of the muscle. From our capillaries, we're going to go to the venules, the veins, so we're going back towards the heart now, into the right atrium, right atrium through a set of valves, to the right ventricle, from the right ventricle, out the pulmonary arteries, so we're going towards the lungs, and there's another set of capillaries in the lungs where we get gas exchange. Right, so it's the opposite of what we saw at the muscle tissue here. At the muscle, we were dropping off oxygen, or the red blood cells are dropping off oxygen and picking up CO2. Here, in the lungs, it's dropping off CO2 so that we can breathe it out and taking in oxygen. So once we get rid of the CO2 and we take in more oxygen, saturate the red blood cells, go from the pulmonary veins, so going back towards the heart now, to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, again we have this whole closed circuit. Um, coronary circulation we'll get into a, in a later video if we need to, but again we have this closed circuit where we have two points of gas exchange. These two points of gas exchange will become really, really important when we get into um, partial pressures and a little bit more pulmonary physiology in the coming videos. So here's just kind of a zoomed out view to give you a big picture of our circuit. Right, again, if we start in the left ventricle, we come out of the aorta um, to any tissue in the body that's going to need oxygen. To the capillaries, from our capillaries, back towards our veins, veins to a vena cava, vena cava, right atrium, right ventricle, pulmonary arteries, another set of capillaries in the lungs so we can exchange gases. From the lungs to the pulmonary veins, and back to our left atrium, excuse me, left atrium to left ventricle, and we start it all over again. All right, our cardiac cycle. Okay, so we define the cardiac cycle as the beginning of one beat to the beginning of the next beat. And there's really two parts to each cardiac cycle. All right, so we have a part called systole and a part called diastole. If you're not familiar with these terms, systole just means the heart is contracting. Diastole means the heart is relaxing. Right, so during systole, I get a contraction of the left ventricle where I'm able to pump blood out of the aorta, start pushing it towards the tissues that are active and might need oxygen. During diastole, um, I just kind of remember this and I help my students remember it by thinking diastole means dead. I got two Ds, diastole dead. Um, diastole is where the heart is relaxing. The left ventricle is able to fill back up so that when we hit systole again, uh, we can pump an efficient amount of blood out of that left ventricle and get oxygen towards the tissues. Again, we said systole is contraction, which means I'm emptying out that ventricle, right? The heart depolarizes, all these intercalated discs and cardiac muscles start to contract in kind of a wave-like fashion together, and blood is pushed out of the heart. 
and diastole. Talk about being dead, so it's relaxing, and the ventric ventricle is filling back up to get ready for the next round of systole. All right, the next part of this, we're going to go through, I believe, 10 or 11 terms here. Um, they're, I think, are really important, uh, just to define so that if you're reading something or we say them in subsequent videos, that you know what they are and you're not stopping and searching for terms all quickly, um, going frantic. I hate when that happens in classes. So our first one, heart rate, everybody should be familiar with, right? Just the number of times your heart beats per minute. Right? If you use a heart rate monitor, it gives it to you and beats per minute. Our second one is something called stroke volume. So how much blood does the heart, in our case the left ventricle, pump out with each contraction? Right? How much blood is that heart uh, pumping out every time it contracts? If you look at this equation here, um, end diastolic volume and end systolic volume, we'll define shortly, just kind of keep this in mind. So our stroke volume equals end diastolic volume minus our end systolic volume. Right, again, don't get caught up on those. We're going to get to them in just a second. Cardiac output just tells us how much blood or the volume of blood the heart pumps out each minute. Okay, so our cardiac output gives us our heart rate or beats per minute times stroke volume, i.e. how much uh, blood is the heart pumping out with each beat. Heart rate times stroke volume gives us a cardiac output. All right, our fourth term, AVO2 difference. Um, for me, I just kind of break the word apart, and it makes sense. The difference of oxygen between the arteries and the veins. Right, so that's all it's telling us. So if we look at, we have arteries, capillaries, and then veins. So what is the difference between the arteries and the capillaries, and how much oxygen is left? Right. So if you're sitting and you're doing nothing, and we look at the AVO2 difference, let's say in the leg muscles. Right. If the legs aren't active, they don't need metabolism because you're just sitting there. They don't need a bunch of metabolism. So AVO2 difference is probably going to be pretty low, right? It didn't take, uh, the muscle tissue of the legs didn't take much oxygen, which means I have a, roughly the same amount left over when I get to the veins. So difference between the arteries and the veins is pretty small. Versus if you get up and start running and the uh, musculature in the legs needs oxygen, we go from the arteries to the capillaries where we have gas exchange. The muscle starts getting kind of greedy. It takes as much oxygen as it can get, or as much as it needs at that point. And when we get to the veins, we have less left over, so we have a bigger AVO2 difference. Our fifth one is preload. Um, if you think about somebody preloading before they jump, this is kind of the same thing, but with the heart. Right, where they preload and they stretch out the tissues if you're going to jump and I get a little bit of elastic rebound to help me jump higher. Kind of the same thing with the heart. Um, if we can fill the left ventricle and we can stretch out the myocardium or the heart muscle there just a little bit, we get a little more rebound and the heart contracts more forcefully. Right, So it's related to our end diastolic volume. Again, we'll get to that. Preload we just talked about. Afterload, these two kind of go together. Um, afterload is the pressure that the heart must overcome to eject blood from the left ventricle. All right, if we remember back to that blood flow we talked about, left ventricle through a set of valves to the aorta to get to the tissues. Um, so if we have a set of valves that's preventing backflow into the left ventricle, right? left ventricle, valves, aorta, it's preventing blood from flowing from the aorta back towards the left ventricle. Um, and those arteries we said are high pressure, that means that Every time the heart beats, it's got to beat hard enough to open up those valves to push blood out into the aorta. Right? And the amount of pressure that's built up on those valves is termed afterload. End diastolic volume and end systolic volume. Um, again, we mentioned these when we talked about stroke volume. So end diastolic volume is the amount of blood that is left or that is in the left ventricle just before systole begins. Right, so the heart is relaxing, relaxing, relaxing. How much blood is in that left ventricle right before it starts to contract? Um, and then in, in systolic volume, kind of the opposite. So after the heart contracts, right before it starts relaxing, how much blood is left in the left ventricle? Right, so we said stroke volume. If we take our end diastolic volume, so the amount of blood that has filled the left ventricle while it's relaxing, End diastolic volume minus our end systolic volume will give us a stroke volume. 
right? And all this kind of ties together in what's called ejection fraction, or it just gives us a, a way of comparing the stroke volume and the end diastolic volume, right? Of how efficient was your heart at pumping the blood out that was able to fill up during diastole, right? So our ejection fraction is equal to systolic, or I'm sorry, stroke volume over end diastolic volume. And that just kind of tells us how efficient was your heart how at uh, beating um, forcefully, how much blood was it able to pump out. All right, our last one here for cardiovascular terms is something called rate pressure product. Um, and it just gives us an estimate of how hard the myocardium or the heart itself is working, right? or how much oxygen is that myocardium um, that makes up the heart demanding right now. Okay. All this is is rate pressure product is equal to our systolic blood pressure times your heart rate. Um, this doesn't really give us a performance measure by any means, but it does tell us your ability of your heart to contract and relax and uh, how efficient it is able to be. All right, let's get into some blood pressure here. Uh, we really got two types of blood pressure, right? Our systolic and our diastolic blood pressure. If you remember, we talked about systole being while the heart is contracting. So we're just looking at how high does the pressure get in the arteries when the heart contracts, right? That gives us our systolic blood pressure. Our diastolic blood pressure, and the same thing if we talk about diastole, how low does the pressure in the arteries get when the heart's relaxing, right? How much pressure is able to bleed off between contractions of the heart? All right, our last thing on blood pressure, something called mean arterial pressure. Right, we said we had two blood pressures, systole, or I'm sorry, systolic blood pressure and diastolic blood pressure. Uh, mean arterial pressure just gives us an average of these two things depending on what somebody is doing. Okay, so the average pressure exerted on the artery wall during a period of time. And if we look at an equation for mean arterial pressure, it's equal to our diastolic blood pressure plus... 0.33 times systolic blood pressure minus diastolic blood pressure. And the important thing about this here is this 0.33 in this equation. Right, the 0.33 tells us that one third of the time at rest, it's really important, at rest, one third of the time the heart spends contracting. So it spends one third of its time in systole. Right? So this equation has to account for that if we want to get a mean pressure. If we look at an exercise equation, equation is the same except our 0.33 changes to something around 0.5. Right? <clears throat> so 0.33 here was the time that the heart spends in systole or contracting. Now we have how much time does the heart spend in systole? About half the time during exercise. Right? It's the only thing that changes there. All right, time for some big takeaway points. I hope you guys grasp from this. Uh, just some things to remember. Right, the main job of our cardiovascular system is to deliver oxygen to the tissues so that we can keep aerobic metabolism going. Again, the cardiovascular system is a slave to the metabolic demands of the body. Anytime metabolism ramps up, so if I start to exercise or start to run, metabolism starts to ramp up or I need more ATP for muscular contractions, cardiovascular system better start picking up so that we can deliver oxygen for that. And we have five parts of the system. We have a pump, or the heart. We have arteries, it's a high pressure distribution. We have capillaries, really thin walled vessels where gas exchange can occur. We have veins that are taking blood back to the heart uh, that have those valves in them to prevent backflow because the pressure is so low. And we have fluid. Again, we can even break this down further and make it into three parts where we have a pump, we have pipes, our arteries, capillaries, and veins, and we have a fluid in those pipes. And then lastly, we have two phases of the cardiac cycle we talked about. Systole, where the heart's contracting to pump blood out of the aorta to get it systemically to the tissues. And diastole, where the heart's relaxing and filling back up. And each phase of the cardiac cycle produces a blood pressure. And when the heart's contracting, the highest pressure we get in the arteries is systolic blood pressure. As the heart's relaxing, diastolic blood pressure tells us how low that pressure gets um, between contractions when we have time for the pressure to bleed off. 
All right, guys, I hope you enjoyed that. Um, hopefully it was a quick brush up, or if it was new to you, feel free to bring questions to the Facebook page or shoot us an email. Um, also, feel free to share this video if you thought it was helpful or you know somebody that may help out. We're really excited about how IFAST University is growing and the, the great group of professionals are able to come together and get better. Uh, if you have questions, again, send us an email or we'll see you on the Facebook page. Thanks.